Coming up today on episode nine of the Elevate 02 podcast, we follow up on a conversation we had at the end of episode eight about different play styles in hockey and how to get players to know, identify, and accept their roles and how maybe that changes based on the age that you are. We also bring on a great guest. Steven Gianta is going to stop by, former NHL player, played parts of eight seasons in the NHL. Now he's got two Stanley Cups as a scout for the Tampa Bay Lightning. So enjoy Geo, and let's get to it. This is the Brady Farkas. This is the Elevate 02 Podcast, brought to you by Money Mitch. The podcast bringing you inside the world of hockey. From on the ice to inside the front office, we bring you places you've never been before. Now, here are your hosts, Tori Mitchell, Jonathan Bates, Brian Strait, and Brady Farkas. Before we get into episode nine of the podcast, I want to tell you real quick about Selly Salt, a special one-time partner here around the holiday seasons of the Elevate 02 podcast. We all know that Selly is short for celebration. When Mitch scored his 67 career NHL goals, he had a nice big Selly on the ice. Strader had six career goals. He also had Sellies on the ice. Batesy and I, well, you know that story already. Selly salt is the ideal combination of sea salt flakes, granulated garlic, and black pepper, specially designed to season all foods and recipes perfectly. If you go to sellysalt.com and you make an order over $50, you receive free shipping. U.S. addresses only, people. If you go to sellysalt.com and make an order and you spend more than $50, you get free U.S. shipping. Hey, if you spend under $50, you're just getting a great product that makes your food better. So be like Mitch after his 67 career goals and Selly with us here on the Elevate 02 podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome in episode nine of the Elevate 02 podcast. We continue to roll along. Batesy the professor, money Mitch, Strader, I'm Farky. So we are, uh, we're back at it, heading towards the holidays. We got so much going on. I'm so pumped about the growth of this podcast. You guys are too. So uh, the numbers show it. So thanks for the support, everybody. What's going on, guys? No, I just noticed you got the, you got like the cool like DJ, like I'm in Vegas at a pool party, like one headphone thing going on here. You are those good, new, Farky? Yeah, those no, are sharp these- too. These are actually, I'm recording from my apartment today. I usually record from my work, from my actual office. But uh, so uh, these are my B headphones, but I do like them. They're a nice bright red color, but uh, I only have one ear on because I'm trying to make sure I don't blow out the entire building with how loud I can get. So I'm trying to have like some <laughs> semblance of my, uh, you know, of my own volume. I <laughs> like it. You. We, we hear you loud and clear. So yeah. for what it's worth. I think the rest of the building hears me loud and clear too. By the way, the on, there there are no negatives about this podcast, but the only negative that there could be is that with four people, there's so many different cooks in the kitchen and so many different – everybody's got different availability. I didn't think we were going to get this episode taped today based on Batesy giving us like the most limited amount of time possible in his schedule. And Strader – I'm sorry for you, man. You 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 were out scouting a game and came back to like 39 text <laughs> messages of Batesy telling us when he was and wasn't available. And the only time he was available was 9 a.m. on a Monday. Strader a doesn't even guy. get a choice. It's almost like Strader doesn't even get a choice on the times. He's just like, uh, oh, I can't make it work. Yeah, no, right? I, I'm over here making it work, and Batesy, you know, he takes 10 days of vacation. So Batesy we have to work around his, his schedule now. One hour. I, Time out. Time out. I worked from vacation oh, for this okay. podcast. Okay. You saw it was challenging. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you guys all saw that. Go by the pool. Yeah. It was hard. Okay. <laughs> I had to tell my kids to leave the pool and go back inside so that we could do this. Okay. So I, I made you, my own sacrifices. You, you, you had, uh, you gave us one hour the entire week. You said you were slammed. <laughs> and then I'm not going to name names. We had a pretty, we have a pretty big guest coming on. And, all of a sudden, he goes, well, I might be able to be available for that one. I might have an hour. Uh-huh. I'm a busy guy. I'm a busy yeah. guy. What can I yeah. say? You know, what can I say? Yeah. You know, we, we do have full-time jobs in addition to this podcast. And Batesy's pulling out terms I've never heard of. Like, it's a big Q4. It's a big Q4. I'm busy right now. <laughs> it is. It is a very – Q4 is real, fellas. Okay? Q4 is real. Like, in yeah, hockey world, it's – I Q4 so much. I, dude, I know. I feel – like, straighters had to hear me bitch about Q4. But, like, 
dude it's real man that whole like that whole like stigma like oh it's the end of the year end of the quarter like i always thought people were blowing smoke it's real fellas it's real. next he's oh. going to be dropping terms like hold on hold on it's we're at the beginning of a big fiscal year like, <laughs> <laughs> That's side note. Begins July one. That this begins is July actually 1. speak for yourself because this is my full time job. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's That's yeah. true. I do appreciate though that Batesy and I, both of us on Twitter, put in host of Elevate Two podcast in our Twitter bio. So we're we're committed straighter. I'm we're not as on active it. on Twitter. When are we going to get you to, to join us? I get on Twitter. I got to change it on. I got to change it on everything. I'm just so tied up with it. Look, I'm tied up because oh. Batesy can't find the right time. <laughs> yeah. to, yep. to <laughs> to do the podcast all right so i can't find time to change all that stuff I know, as soon yeah. as i do i'll change it you well, know what i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna take this one for the team okay guys i <laughs> i take full responsibility for everybody's scheduling issues and i'll i, I thank you guys for being so accommodating i really appreciate that well, well not no. yours because you're <laughs> you've, you you just said that this is your full-time job you Correct. can't even get us you can't even get us blue check mark yeah, now uh, I got a, no, I got no, a no. doppelganger on my on, on Instagram too. I mean, somebody acting like Brian straight for the podcast. So, I mean, I got I got so many different things going on, you know, to deal with over uh, here. Far straight, here. I will I will say that picture that I did post of you where you're in the uh, the New Jersey Devils. I don't know where you're, what you must have been in their the main office there scouting. A lot of likes. People you got a lot loved of likes. it. Good, good. People really liked it. Oh, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. People uh, like a man hard at action, work, I guess. Action, yeah. action shot. Yep. Wait, the one where he's at is yep. he's at his computer. They liked it. Oh, a wasn't lot. that in That's, your? Was that? Yeah, it's it's was, where I'm sitting right now. It's oh. in his home office. <laughs> his home office. Yeah. Well, it looked it looked like you were you were serious deep into scouting. So yeah, oh, people it's loved it's, it. It's, you know, it's, we it's, were talking. <laughs> Stage. We were, it was definitely stage. It was stage. <laughs> yeah. it was stage. We were talking off air after the last episode happened, after episode eight, after we talked with Gomer, and we ended the ended that episode kind of talking about creativity, and and we got into a discussion about you know how much creativity has exploded in the game, and it has. And then I kind of want to bring that conversation we had to this episode now because i think it's a good place to go to for the next portion of the conversation there is a level of creativity in the game that we've never seen before it is important for players to learn that creativity and have the freedom to to do that and have that kind of mindset but it's also important to note there is room for other kinds of players as well like especially straighter and mitch as people who work with kids you don't want to make them feel like they have to do that stuff to be successful. There's all different ways to be successful in the game of hockey, and that's just one element of it. The Elevate 02 podcast is brought to you in part by Frank Crum. Frank Crum is a professional employer organization that partners with businesses to assist with human resources, workers' compensation insurance, risk management, employee benefits, and payroll administration. When you partner with Frank Crum, you are increasing your profits, productivity, saving a ton of time, and reducing your liability and cost. They are unique to the PEO industry because they own their own workers' compensation carrier, Frank Winston Crum Insurance, and they work with difficult industries like construction, roofing, plumbing, electricians, and even some trucking. Visit frankcrum.com and tell them Elevate 2 sent you. And if you're an insurance agent or broker, visit frankcrum.com to hear how you can offer Frank Crum's PEO services to your clients. Straighter, you can take it. Here. Yeah, no, no. I And this is kind of something that I kind of built my little side business around is, is I want to help players that, first of all, understand there's, everyone has different types of skill set and there's no right or wrong way to play hockey, right? And I think as a player, a young player, uh, professionally, I had a hard time kind of deciphering what my role was uh, to the organization. And as I look at it now and take a step back on the other side and seeing what they wanted from me, I'm like, ah, it all like makes sense to me um, in the end. And with player development, I love what we're doing. We're raising the bar of the skill set that you need to play at the, the next level. But at the same time, there are so many different roles uh, in professional hockey that I feel like it gets lost in the weeds sometimes. And we're just trying to make this one prototypical type player now. And, and it's really hindering development, I think, in the U.S. And, and for some reason, I always talk about it, you know, the Scandinavian countries, 
I don't know how they do it. They have many millions less than us, but they still produce the same amount of really good players, top end players as us. I don't know how they do it, but um, it's always a concern for me when I look at USA hockey. I, I, I look at a player just to give you a, a couple specific examples, just watching the highlights, NHL highlights this year. I look at the Kachuk brothers. I look at a guy like uh, Josh Anderson on the Canadians. These guys are, you know, 10 years ago, they're not the type of guys that are scoring goals like through their legs. You know, they're like a, right. almost like a Ryan Klo 10 years ago, right? Where he just, he just, he, he's just, he does everything. And those guys, you see how creative they are right now. That's the, the ideal player for me. They're, they do it all. And they can also pick the puck up on their stick and do a lacrosse style if they wanted to. But um, they just, th that player right there, if if you could have three or four of those guys on each team, you got a chance to win the Stanley Cup. But uh, they they just hit every box. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong there, Beatsy. No, I, I actually think those are all really great examples um, of of. Like yes, the modern power. day. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yesterday's power, power forward. forward. Yesterday's creative. power forward yeah. is Ryan Klo, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Th like, how many times did I ask you about him when you were playing with him? Like, God, oh, like, just, uh, a just, freak. just, just a freak. Like, I was drooling yeah. over him every time he played because he's a difference maker. He's the type of player that would put you over the top. Yeah. Um, but transition, you know, fast forward eight, 10, 12 years later. And, and you know, no disrespect to Ryan Klo, but he couldn't do the things that Matthew Kachuk can do with the puck. You know, right. to your point. And now, Josh Anderson, um, Brady Kachuk, Matthew Kachuk, all those types of guys, those are the new age skilled power forwards, right? The power forward kind of definition is dramatically shifted from ten years ago to today. Like all yeah. the power forwards in the game can do two things really, really well. Number one is handle the puck, and number two is skate. You know, Ryan Klo was was so great in small spaces. L Lord knows I wouldn't <clears> want to be a defenseman trying to, you know, move him from a five foot radius around the, the net. But nowadays today, like Josh Anderson, you give that guy the puck and open mm -hmm. ice. Holy shit. He's gone. You know, he is, he is like a freight he, train. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's the big transition, you know, like, yeah. like even look at some of those like like James Van Riemsdyk. Mm -hmm. who's straighter you know very well or, or max pacioretty mitch who you know like those guys those guys have really done a great job of transitioning from you know their their early careers where they were they were two-way offensive skill guys now they're because of the way the game has changed you, you could classify them as power forwards yeah you know because what they do you mean have power forward power forward is a basketball term to me Sure. No, it's a great question. So like if you were to define and, and I'll, I'll pick you guys piggyback off of me if you disagree, but if I were to define a power forward, I'd say somebody that's really great in small areas, um, strong net presence, um, obviously has a physical attributes to back it up, size, strength, power, of course, um, is hard on pucks, can recover, protect, drive, gritty. um, very gritty. Exactly. And, and usually makes his living in and around the, the blue paint, you know, the, the yeah. crease, um, scores most of his goals, probably within an eight to 10 foot radius to that area. Um, and, and that was Ryan Klo. Um, and Mitch, you can speak to his game when you played with him, but now, you know, these guys that we just named, they can do all those things. Plus they can do it in open ice. They can take yeah. the puck from, from there, you know, full 200 foot game. So uh, I don't know if you guys agree with that definition, but that's kind of how I would classify it. I, I totally agree with that definition. And I'd also add to the fact what you just talked about of you got to be able to skate and you got to be able to produce off the rush as a power forward now. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the big parts of the game, when you watch a guy like Josh Anderson, like teams are, or, or Tom Wilson teams are looking for those guys who can take the puck to the net off the, off the rush. Yeah. And in order to do that, you got to be a good skater. You have to have some yeah. speed and these guys do, and they're big, they're strong. They win in the small areas, but they can also win off the line rush with some power as they, force their way to the net and you know just a, a i don't want to cut you off here mitch but a little story of kind of what i'm talking about um i had todd reardon as as a d coach in pittsburgh and he's back there again right and they call him like the d whisperer because he's done such a great job with all of the all of the different uh units that he's had over the years and and especially you know the last couple of years with pittsburgh but I remember coming into like one of my first training camps might've been my second year. We had, um, I don't know if you remember him. Do you remember Bo Bennett? 
Yep. I do. Yeah. He was, yep. a, he was a first round pick out of Penticton, a BCHL, right? Yep. California and kid. Went to, as went as to, we talked about those California yeah. kids, like yeah, yeah, yeah. do crazy yeah. stuff with the puck. Right. Yeah. So I remember we're sitting there in the lunchroom and uh, just chatting and everyone's like screwing around and I don't know, Boast did something ridiculous in, in practice that day. And Reards is behind us. And I'm just kind of like, I was just like kind of pumping his tires. I'm like, that was sick. I'm like, I'm like, somebody said something to the fact like, oh yeah, straighter, you should try to do that. I'm like, yeah, there's no <laughs> chance in hell I could do anything close to that. I wish I could all this stuff. And, and Reards always like struggle with me to like get me to play the way he wanted to early on in my career. Mm-hmm. And he just kind of like looked at me and gave me this like stare. Right. And he's like, he's like, you know, Brian, Bo can do some good stuff with the puck, but you have talents that he doesn't have and that are very valuable for the org- like in front of a bunch of people in fr- and that are very valuable to us. And if you put it all together, you're going to be just as valuable of a player for this organization than anybody else. So I think that was one of those. And that's kind of what I'm talking about of like understanding identities, um, helping players find their identity. Obviously you don't have to do it at a very young age, but at the pre- professional level, that was a time where I was trying to kind of figure it out. And um, yeah, I, I thought that one really put it in perspective for me. Uh, and, and Mitch, I want to hear from you on that, but that's a great, uh, that's a great point, right? If you had, every team wants to draft and develop a handful of power forwards, right? That's primarily how you're, how you're going to get those guys. Of course, there are a few exceptions, but primarily you got to find those guys in the draft and you got to develop them properly. Yeah. However, if you had, if you had 12 power forwards up front, like, you know, but nobody that can yeah. kill penalties effectively, you're probably not going to be a balanced team. So it's to your, to, to Reardon's point with you, like you mm-hmm. have, you had gifts that, that he couldn't do. And, and that's how you build an effective and competitive team. Yeah. I'll throw another name out there too. And I had the chance to play with him uh, in LA uh, my last year and who I think last year um, he got, Last year or the year before, he got traded to Pittsburgh, and he's still doing it because he can skate. Power forward Jeff Carter. Oh. I mean, I, I don't know all the stat lines, but if you went back uh, and you looked at, you know, uh, the top five centers goal scoring wise, he's in the mix. He's with oh, yeah. McDavid, Crosby, McKinnon, where it's like, wow. Jeff Carter's name's on there because he scores 30 goals a year. You know, when he got, I think when he got traded to Pittsburgh, he ended up, you know, in like the 15 games that he played after the deadline, he had like nine or 10 goals. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know his stat this year, but he's one of those guys that because he can skate, I mean, and he's big and he's fast and he can score. Um, he's transitioning perfect at age 36 into oh, yeah. this next wave of speed and skill. It's crazy. Well, and- and and he's a he's a great example, Mitch, of a guy that was able to differentiate his game, right? He was drafted as a as a center, right? But then they had Mike Richards as well in the same draft year, and he had the ability to shift to wing and be inc- just just as valuable there, um, you know, freak. as he was at center. Just a freak freak player. Yeah. But I remember, um, I don't know if you guys remember the, the he was pretty much a career backup, Curtis Sanford, the Sandman, great great dude, but. Yep. Um, I worked with him in van. He was one of the goalie coaches and, um, <laughs> I was kind of shooting the breeze with him over a couple of beers. I'm like, Sandman, like name one guy in your career that you hated, hated when they shot on you just had like a lethal shot and no hesitation before I could get it out. He's like Jeff Carter. He's yeah. like, I had to practice against that guy every day in, in Columbus. He's like, he's the only guy who shot literally made me nervous thinking he could, he could kill me. <laughs> that's how that's how deadly his release was. Yeah, uh, dude, that's that, it's crazy though. Like when I when you talk about Jeff Carter, right? Like how much he stands out in the game now, and it probably oh. wasn't like that 15 years ago because you're like, wow, this guy's massive. He can yeah. skate. He can play yeah. every position. It's just like those guys are so valuable at this point of the game, just because mm-hmm. where yeah. we're at. I want to ask this question because we have a wide range of listeners on the podcast, right? Some listeners that are, you know, longtime hockey veterans and some listeners that are 14 year old kids that are just starting out here. You guys are talking about roles on the ice and very specific talents that come with those roles. 
that specialization happens as you get older. But when you are a kid starting out, and Strader, I know you've been working with kids. Mitch, obviously, you have too. You don't want to start that specialization that early, right? You don't want to pigeonhole a kid at 14, 15. So that stuff is great for the NHL because you need a specific skill set to help the team accomplish its goals. But if you are a kid who is just starting out, what's your advice to them about trying to identify themselves or, or rather, to you, to your point, Strader, um, find their identity? Uh, you know, I, I just always go back to enjoy the process, right? Like, it's just about, for, for kids, it's about getting better every day and getting better constantly and enjoying the process of, of kind of building towards something. Not everybody's going to be the fastest guy. Not everybody's going to be have the best hands, but you can improve in those things if you kind of keep stacking days up on top of each other. And I think the message here for me is just like, it doesn't matter where you're at at this point. You can still build off stuff. You can still get better. And then once you do become, you know, 19, 20 years old, never know. You get lucky and, and, and there is something, somebody identifies you for a certain role that you can fit into an organization. And that's that's really what we're kind of striving for. Like, like I said, everyone needs to meet that benchmark of skill at this point because it's just been raised so drastically high at this point. Yeah, I, I would just, Farky, to answer that question specifically, I would just say try it all. You know, the, the more you try, the, the more you can do. And the more you can do, the more confident you are and the more creative you'll be. So it's sure. just just try it all. And, you know, like uh, Strader saying, stacking days on top of each other. It shouldn't feel that way because it might feel that way when you're a 35 year old professional. You're like, okay, this is the job now. Yes. Yeah. My body's not responding like I used to. But when you're a kid, like stacking those days is just, it's just really having fun. And, you know, and you, you, you have fun with it. That's what I, that's you stack kind of days. What I mean. Yeah. You, totally. I think to, to my, I, I work with more high school age kids too, right? They're trying to get to Division One programs or whatnot. But one of the thing I always talk, and I always talk to this about them. I go, well, he's a lefty, right? And he plays the left side. How often do you play the right? Never. What do you mean you never play the right? Like, that's what happened to me. I played the left side my whole career. I get to the NHL, I have to play the right side. And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, mm -hmm. I have no clue what I'm doing. I go, just get out. Even if you're playing center, get back there and play center. It doesn't matter. Positionless hockey is just mm -hmm. so important at this point. I was, yeah. uh, I got, sorry, BT, I real quick, okay. I moved to, I moved to, uh, Kevin Stenton moved me to wing my junior year in college. And I had played center like from age, yeah, whatever to whatever. <laughs> and I was like shell shocked. Um, it was, it was Dean Strong, who was just a, another natural center. We wanted to play together, but he was like, I don't know if I could play wing. And I'm like, I don't think I can play wing, but <laughs> it was, it was great. It, it really, it helped me prepare for the next level, you know, I <laughs> learned another position. Anyways, what do you got? What do you got? <laughs> and what? I remember I'm just laughing because then because Len was on the uh, P Peter Lennis yeah. was on the other side, and I remember Len just being like, "Figure it out, boys!" Like, he was <laughs> like God. But yeah, well, so. and and just to piggyback off that, like in in all seriousness, like I think what's the important message too, and and what I'm hearing out of you guys is, like, if you're a young player, you gotta be you gotta be accommodating. Right. Because there is going to come a time when um, all of a sudden, hey, like your team might need you to fill, fill a void somewhere on the roster. And the reality is, is even though the kind of the, the roster construction nowadays is changed or shifted from top six, bottom six to maybe like top nine, fourth line. Um, it, it's important that you understand all the different roles within your lineup and, and how you could play those. Right. Um, Mitch, like. I'm pretty sure it was like, didn't you play defense one game our freshman year of college? Yeah. 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 I mean, like, I skate so well. Because we had, you could we were, skate. We were, right. Yeah. We're playing at Princeton. And they're like, yeah. looking down mm -hmm. the bench, we had like 3D left. And it was like, you, and I was like, really? Seriously? <laughs> All right. <laughs> let's go. I'll play D. That's great. Uh, it's kind of a Bobby Orr back there. Not a big deal. But. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I do. But yeah, it's it, it's important. Go ahead, Farky. Sorry. No, I was going to say, now I do want to ask a very specific NHL-based question because it's something I've always wondered about, again, as we talk about role definition on a team. And I'm using a baseball analogy here just because it's easy for me to conceptualize this. So let's just say a team has two center fielders. Well, player A only plays when there's a left-handed pitcher and player B only plays when there's a right-handed pitcher. And they just keep bouncing back and forth that way. So those two players are really good in those roles. 
But those two players also want to become everyday players and they want to work on the things that the organization thinks they're deficient at. So do you ever get frustrated by a team trying to pigeonhole you into one thing? Like, hey, we know you're good at this. And you're like, yeah, I know I'm good at this. But I'd also like to get good at everything else because that helps me get better. I can make more money if I can do that. I get more I mean, I get I just get to be a better all around player rather than being good at this one specific thing. Does that ever frustrate you guys at the NHL level? A little bit, um, you know, the, the guy, all the guys that end up, you know, being the grinders, quote unquote grinders, which, you know, they were top of their game, top of their team, uh, D forward growing up, going into the NHL. But when you get to that level and you do get, uh, you know, you get, not, I wouldn't say pigeonhole, but this is your role now. <laughs> yeah. You, you do uh, slowly start to lose the creativity that you thought you had when you were playing junior or college. Um, that's just, that's just the reality. I mean, I was a prime example. I was quarterback in the power play and on. When, when did you college. have, crea- when did you have creativity? <laughs> <laughs> when, when I had, a, when I had a point of game in college, not a big game. I, I think you have, you know, and then I'm a, I'm a face off guy in the <laughs> yeah. NHL. Yeah. It, it is what it was. I, I, I think you got two great examples. Sorry, me too. This no, right don't, now, don't. Like, of a guy who accepted his role in Tory. And how many games did you play? Uh, counting playoffs, probably seven hundred and fifty. And a guy who went against the grain a little bit, and myself, and I only played two hundred. Right? Like, if I had accepted my role as a six-seven guy in New York, I probably, I, I probably would would have been there quite a bit longer. But. Mm-hmm. I thought that I could play more. I thought I should have an opportunity to play more. I wanted to explore it. It didn't work out in other places, but it, it really is like it's it's a <laughs> you got to be it's quite the seesaw that you're on. You got to be very careful. You got to find an organization that believes in you, that likes you. And at some point in your career, you know, I was maybe 26 at the time. It was like that time of like you make the decision: Do I move on and try? somewhere else and see if I can latch on and be an everyday guy, or do I stay here where it's comfortable? And, you know, I probably could have had another three years there. Um, I went for the the first part of that and sometimes it doesn't work out. Bates, has it always been this way or is this an analytics thing? As analytics has come in, analytics has pinpointed exactly what a player is good at and therefore has told the organization, like, we're only going to put the player in this situation because we know they excel at it. Has this always been this way or is it just a last 10 years analytics based thing? Um, You know, it's it's probably a a situational component to that question. I, I I don't think it's analytics only, though, personally. Um, and I also don't think hockey is a, a great measuring tool for that for reasons we've, we've chatted about before. But um, I think that it's a, it's a good tool to look at. And if something is certainly measurable, you want to have a, a clearer picture of, of what that tells you. Um, you know, in terms of role definition, like we've kind of alluded to it, and Mitch just talked about it a minute ago, I think what's really hard for players is is accepting the fact that, hey, like, you know, and it doesn't matter if you get to the NHL, you get to the AHL, college, major, junior, whatever, whatever next big jump you make as a player in your development, when you get to that level and you recognize, hey, like, I'm no longer, you know, the big fish in the small pond. I'm now just another player on this roster that A, needs to prove himself and B, can do a lot of things well that other teams or excuse me, other players on this team can do well. I think that's really kind of the eye opener. And and it goes back to the, the confidence discussion that we've had before, um, you know, recognizing your individual skill, right? What, like every player in the NHL has at least one skill that they're really good at. Um, you know, like like Mitch's was skating. Like he's a, he was a very good skater, right? He had speed, strong on his feet, and that's what kept him in the league for a long time. Um, and and he always asked himself, hey, like, how, how am I going to use this skill to stay in the lineup night after night, you know? Um, and I think that that's really what separates a lot of everyday NHL players from guys that, that kind of just want to make it and find a role. You know, I want to ask this question straight, or I don't want to put you on the spot because it's kind of an unfair question. So you don't even have to answer it if you don't want to. But, um, <laughs> but I'm still, there's a question. Don't answer it but, if you but, want to. But, but I'm still, I'm still going to ask I'm gonna, it. Yeah. I'm going to throw it out there. I hope it's a chirp. <laughs> no, it's, it's not so much a chirp. I'm just curious. 
you know, and I'll, I'll use a, a, a modern day example. When I play hoops at the YMCA, I'm perfectly fine being on a bad team because I get all the shots and I get to do whatever I want. Sure. <clears throat> excuse me. And I know that, <clears throat> excuse me. And I know the team is counting on me and I get to score as much as I want. I'd rather be on the bad team where I get everything rather than the good team that stays on the court all day, but I get a shot here and there. So you're talking about straight or not necessarily wanting to come to terms with that role. Would you have rather been, <clears throat> damn, I have to edit all this out. <clears throat> Would you have rather been a player who got to do everything on a not great team or accepted that role, not played as much, been pigeonholed a bit, but been on a better team? See, my Oof. story is a little different than that, right? Like I, <laughs> I came to New York when we were in a tough spot. I was playing top four minutes. And then everybody gets slotted back into their spot, right? Eventually, once we got better and we started becoming a playoff team. So I think if it was the other way around and I was just slotted there when I first got in there, the experience would have been better. And I, I, all I really do want to be is like on a winning team. Obviously, you want to play, though. That's the, the one thing that, that hurts when you're in and out of the lineup, when you play 40 games a year and then – you know, maybe get a couple playoff games. It's tough because you feel kind of disconnected to the team a bit. Um, but I think part of the issue there in Long Island with me was the fact that I started up here and I slowly went down here, even though I was 26 years old and I was slotted in the right spot at one point um, on a winning team. And and it was kind of like, God, like I just, you, you know, you felt so a part of the, the, the process at one point and then you're on the same team with the same people and then you felt like an afterthought so that was a struggle in that situation and if it was the other way around i would have been perfectly happy with it it's 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 a really good question farky and i think it happens to a lot of guys if they play long enough um i went my my story i went from a stanley cup contender boop, 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 worked my way down to buffalo <laughs> And, uh, you know, was, was some nights playing second line center, um, with, with, you know, Gianta and whoever, and, you know, was playing 15 minutes a night. And I had a chance to showcase myself to get traded at the deadline, two goals against Vancouver the day before the deadline. Thanks, Batesy. And, uh, and, you know, I end up getting traded back to a Stanley cup contender and playing four or five more years. You know, and it, there was a point when I was in Buffalo um, thinking at Christmas when we had five wins and 30 losses, I was going to have to start looking at Europe, you know, in year seven or eight of my career. Um, but I I did enough. I were some GM, I showcased myself where some other GMs or Batesies and Straters sitting up there watching me. Uh, maybe put me in the green section again. <laughs> All right, oh, we might be able to, you know, we might be able to use him. green. Yep, you were always in the green section, you know, as, <laughs> as, as a fourth line center. So it, it, it that worked out great for me. That was perfect. Did I want to be there on the last place team playing 15 minutes a night for 10 years? No, but <laughs> for, for a cup of tea to get me back to a team that had a chance to win, yes. It's it's tough, man. It's tough being on a really really bad team. I did it once. It's draining. It, I did it once and throughout, like basically like from sixteen to the end of my career. One time I was on the Isles and we were dead last, and it was Awful. a long, long year. Yeah, I I think it's important that both of you guys kind of define your role on a team. Like we talked about power forward, but and Mitch, you've you've alluded to being a grinder. And like, you know, I would classify you more as an energy player, but, um, and straighter, you've, you talked about being a five, six, seven, like, why don't you tell everybody what those mean in your eyes? Like, what was your role on a nightly basis? Yeah, my, I mean, near it transitioned a little bit throughout my career, but you know, I was a checker. Um, I had great speed. My role was to create cause havoc on the four check, uh, definitely not get scored on five on five, um, and, and kill penalties. But, um, you know, when, when you, when you have some really good shifts and make some good plays in the offensive zone where you're getting in on the four check, um, it, that creates that energy. That's why Bates is saying you're an energy guy. And those guys are super important on teams. You mm -hmm. see it, uh, especially come Stanley cup time. 
everybody knows the oh well, those are the guys that win you know those are the guys that get you the cup when the third line fourth line steps up but it's true you know mm -hmm. you get you get guys that just come out of their shoes uh come playoff time that you you didn't even know who they were the whole season and they're fourth line players and all of a sudden they have a point of game you know uh i'm trying to think of what's his name i played with him Devonte smith pelly when uh oh yeah when, he had, when washington went on that run yeah, like yep, yep. He, he was like basically just made the team or got called up earlier in the season and then in the playoffs he just goes mad he goes crazy and you know those those energy guys that's that was the type of player that i was so i mean think about think about um in tampa's terms here like right like when they traded for barkley Goudreau and, and Blake Coleman and gave up a yeah. lot to get them in the same market that I don't know if Taylor Hall was part of that that year of but but like in that type of market where those are the guys that are the headliners at trade yeah. deadline and here's Tampa Bay going out and spending on Barkley Goudreau and everyone's like who's this guy and you know that line Gord Goudreau and, and Coleman basically led them to three cups I mean yeah. if they weren't there they're not winning um so yeah. just what Tori's talking about to his point. It's but for me it was um, you know, I was just Bates will probably kind of talk to us too. I was just the modern day defensive defenseman, really. Um a guy who maybe back in the day you had to be six four and take up a lot of space and, and then it kind of transformed to this. Well, you gotta be able to skate really well. So a guy like my size at six one, six feet six one could actually make it because I could skate well and I defended really well and I had a good stick and really night in night out it was to you know my role like Tori's adapted throughout the time I first get to Long Island it was match up against top players make their life miserable right so um in over my skis playing against Crosby um <laughs> quite a bit and and that's hard to make a guy like that that's like his life miserable but uh you know the the foundation of that role kind of stayed the same even when i was playing in the bottom bottom pairing it's it's whoever you're matched up you gotta obviously play stiff play physical um you know limit scoring chances and really just you know be a hard guy to play against that's really what i prided myself on we'll we'll we'll, we'll get more into like I'm, I'm glad you brought those up straight or like some of those guys like, like the draw and you know, some of those those trade deadline acquisitions. I think it'll be good, Farky, that we, we discuss that as we get closer to the trade deadline. Um, yeah. because you know, we we looked at those in Vancouver when we were really trying to, you know, push ourselves over the top. Um, you know, we called them insurance policies, right? Like guys that essentially you could pick up, you know, for for really it wouldn't cost you a ton, but you, you could pick them up and and they could essentially play anywhere in your lineup if if and when somebody got injured. So um it's it's really important to to plan your roster around those types of guys too. I definitely agree. We get into more of that stuff around the trade deadline. Um, I do want to get to our guest here momentarily, but I'll ask this last question just out of a curiosity. When did you guys know, Mitch and Strader, that you were playing offensive hockey or you were a defensive player? When was that decision made for you, or when did you make it yourself? Because I think everybody would like to be the center who scores a bunch of goals and plays the entire ice, you know, and covers it well, but when did you make the decision of what position you were going to play or when maybe was it made for you? Probably my 25 games into my NHL career. Hmm. <laughs> All right. I said, huh, these guys on the top two lines and on our power play in San Jose are a lot better than me. <laughs> 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 they uh, happen to be a lot more skilled than me. You know, what am I doing here? What's my role? Okay. Don't overthink it, but all right. Like I'm here for a reason, but, uh, quickly realized it was, uh, to use my speed and kill penalties. It was, it was <laughs> within 25 games of my NHL career that I knew, um, I, was not going to be a power play guy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> my, my fate was decided way earlier than that. All right. I was probably like a young kid at this point. I mean, I, I got, I got pigeonholed. I'll say that <laughs> yeah. to, to D because I was the only guy when we were younger that could skate backwards. So I had to play D and I ended up and, and honestly, Hey, Thank, thank you, coaches, my youth coaches. Thank you for letting me play D and actually having a chance because I couldn't really handle the puck. So, um, no, that's, I mean, you know, that's kind of happens to, to kids at a young age. Like, it's like, oh, this kid can skate backwards. So he has to play D. And then I really just, 
that's what I grew up playing. And once I got to, I'd say when I get to the U.S. national program, and this is one of my, I think I had, <laughs> I had enough skill to be a two-way defenseman. But I think, you know, the one thing with that program is they do kind of put you into a box, right? And they do kind of, you know, make you find an identity at 16 years old, which I don't know if that's correct. Um, because, you know, the ultimate goal there is to win championships. That's what the U.S. wanted to do at that time. And and they built a really good program. They've had a lot of success with it, obviously, since then. And I think that they've kind of changed their philosophies there as well. But um, I'd say that was kind of the time where I'm like, oh, this is this is it. This is going to be my role. I'm going to be how old do you, how old do you think, <laughs> Strader, how old do you think Batesy was when he found out that he was going to be a bench warmer? Probably age six, seven. He's gonna, I mean, he, it was certainly one hand. It was certainly gonna one to, hand. He's going to have to go up in the stands and throw a suit on and scout yeah. instead. <laughs> and I got I got to really work. I got to really work on this math homework tonight because the only way I'm going to be able to be involved in this game is if I know how to add. <laughs> That's well, awesome. Why don't we get to our guests because Batesy's given us such limited time here, you know, yeah, in this oh, uh, in God. this taping. So Q4 is coming calling. So we might as well get to our guests right now. We'll pick up some more of this conversation as we continue to build the podcast. But uh, let's get to it so Batesy can eventually get on his way here. Have a good day there, fellas. The Elevate 02 podcast is brought to you in part by Parkview Air Medical. Parkview Air Medical provides professional medical escorts consisting of fully certified ACLS trained paramedics, registered nurses, and physicians. These escorts accompany your patient, your family member, your friends on major commercial airlines. These transports can also be done via train and cruise ships. For those who can't fly, they will assist you in making sure that the journey is safe and stress Free. They'll coordinate the transportation needs to and from the airport, along with wheelchair, seat-to-seat -seat transfers, and baggage assistance. They will ensure a smooth bedside-to-bedside -bedside transition. You can learn more about Parkview Air Medical online at parkviewairmedical.com. They've got a huge medical staff pool. They're able to meet those last-minute requests, and they can have an escort with you or your patient or family member in just a matter of hours. And they have access to visa procurement services also. It's Parkview Air Medical, online at parkviewairmedical.com. All right, after we just got done talking to Batesy, and he told us he had time to continue the podcast. He got all nervous. He's got a big meeting or a flight to catch or something. So Batesy's out now. So Q4 came calling for Batesy. So he's not on this guest call. So we'll have to give him endless amounts of grief in episode number uh, in episode number 10. But I want to welcome on our guest with three-fourths of the hosts of the Elevate 02 podcast. It's our new buddy. Well, my new buddy. You guys know him. Steven Gianta, former NHL player, played with the Islanders and Devils over parts of eight seasons. Brother of Brian Gianta, who was Mitch's old teammate, serves as a scout for the Tampa Bay Lightning now. He's already won a pair of Stanley Cups with them, big in the youth hockey community in his hometown of Rochester, New York. Steven Gianta, welcome in. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Well, before we before we really get into it, I got to ask you this. You're from Rochester. You know what the garbage plate is. The garbage <laughs> plate is Rochester's signature dish. Basically, anything you can think of, put together and do one yeah. big, like, to-go style container. I went to college at Oswego, Central New York, so I have certainly been to Rochester many times. I've been to the, uh, was that Nick Tahoe's, the site of the original garbage plate. Yeah. Honest question. Have you ever eaten a garbage plate earlier than 2 a.m.? No, <laughs> no, no, I've never eaten one before 2 a.m. And I have never been sober eating one either. So yeah. <laughs> garbage plate is the go to drunk food. I had one at noon once that was OK, but it is the go to Dark, drunk yeah. food. It tastes so good at 3.30 or whatever it may be. So uh, it's been since I got to think maybe college since I've actually had one. <laughs> I while. told Parky I was up there in Rochester uh, watching the Amherst one day, and he, that was the first thing he asked me. Have you had the garbage plate? I'm like, I don't even know what the hell that is. <laughs> my Wait, was the original isn't far from the rank downtown. Oh, really? Yeah. No, so no, my right. best friend, I was the best man at his wedding. He lived right down the street, walking distance from the arena. So I went to an Amherst game a couple of years ago with him. His I, like apparently the thing to do now, like when you like pick out your groomsmen, is to give them something. So, so like one time I was a groomsman and I got a bottle of liquor. He gave me a Rochester 
Red Wings baseball hat, but for the night they had changed their name to the Rochester Garbage Plates. So I have a Rochester Garbage Plates hat now, right. which I don uh, you know relatively frequently. I gotta say, yeah, they uh, I think they do it once a year. They change their name for for night, and they uh, have garbage plates uh, at the baseball field. So, well, not a bad one. Very, very cool. Uh, let's get into the hockey stuff because Mitch gets antsy when we don't get into hockey <laughs> right away. So uh, let's work backwards. You're in your third year as a pro scout with the Lightning. As I understand it, that wasn't your initial job. Like that wasn't your initial goal, rather. So how did you get into where you are now? Uh, when I stopped playing, I uh, retired from playing in Bridgeport the last year. Kind of fell into it. I started talking to Jamie Pusher with Tampa about uh, like a college scouting position uh college free agents whatever that entails but they ended up bringing on jeff tambellini instead for that role and you know talking to him it seemed like the pro side was a better fit for me and the schedule being home with the family so they offered that to me and kind of right place right time uh and you know they they did all the hard work i'm just reaping the rewards of of them winning now Strader, Strader says that he was uh, he's enjoying scouting. He loves it. Are you built to be a scout? Are you liking it as much? I, as I am. I am. It, you know, there's something about still having your summers off. Uh, it can be a grind through the winter. Uh, yeah. You do control your schedule, so it, that's kind of nice to be able to do that. You still have, you know, the requirements to get through, but uh, I am enjoying it. I don't want to get you in trouble. Are you watching more games on the sc- on the screen at home from the <laughs> home office, or are you actually going? I'm good. I, I wish I was watching more, but no, uh, all live, all live. He's all out live. more than I am, man. Like, I mean, I, we were talking the other day and I'm like, well, you know, I can do like a couple TV games every, uh, every month. And he's like, whoa, like we got to get to 21. There's a hard line. I'm like, oh my God. So he's running yeah. around like crazy. He's super scout over there. Well, <laughs> he's out at more games live. No wonder the lightning have won two cups and straighter has it. Ooh. Exactly. It always exactly. comes from the top row. Yeah. Right, I, I mean, you just that was too easy. Recipe, the missing ingredient, obviously, to the recipe was uh, was Gio over here when he it, stepped it, in, it, they went absolutely. two cups, and... absolutely. You know, two years, two cups, and I was clearly the missing ingredient. Why can you guys not stay away? You both played, you both made enough money that you probably don't have to do this. I understand, you know, not sitting on money Mitch's stack now, but um, yep. why can you guys not stay away? Um, I'm not my brother. So yeah, I do still have to work. Um, (laughs) you know, it's, it's, it's in you, right. To, you know, I thought about taking some time off after I was done and this job came through and talked to my wife about it and was like, you know, I'm not going to sit home. I'll get bored. So, uh, you know, it, it seemed like the right fit at the time. Now, is it a permanent thing? That's, you know, you know, I can't, decide that yet but if something else comes up you certainly look at those options but it was the right fit at the right time and that's why i'm going with it yeah your wives probably enjoy you not being home that much <laughs> uh, to, to an extent it's if you know september comes around she's like why aren't you on the road yet but <laughs> it comes around it's like i need you home now to help out with the kids so it's yep. you know it's a, it's a mix of having me home for a little bit but then getting annoyed with me and wanting me out of the house Hundred percent. Schedule. That's exactly what I do. Is I mess up the kids' schedule. Uh, you know, the schedule at home. I mess it up. And you're one of the kids. You're you're in the way when you're yes, home. always always in the way. Definitely, always. definitely. My so, wife always says that too. She's like, when you're home, I have three kids to take care of instead of two. So, yeah. and she just gets annoyed with the amount of laundry I got to throw in there because you know I've been on the road for four days or whatever. It's like, well, I mean, and then I just stop changing my clothes. I'm like, all right, I'll just won't change my clothes anymore. The nerve on these. <laughs> right? uh, what have you learned, Stephen, on being on this side of the glass? What have you learned about hockey? Um. It looks easy from up top, right? The game looks easy when you're looking at it from above. And you have to remember that when you're evaluating because when you're on the ice, it's happening in a split second. And it looks like you have no room where when you're looking up up top, it looks like there's a, you know, I could have had a 20-year career. It's it's so it's so true. I I uh, just from being healthy scratched or from, uh, I mean, you guys, I know you've had the injuries as well, being up in the rafters while well, now you're scouting, but... It's you're up there going, what? 
the fuck is he doing? All of a sudden, you're you're one of the uh, the bleacher creatures, you know, yeah. uh, thinking it looks so easy, but it's so true. From up there, it's <laughs> it looks pretty simple, and then you get down to ice level, and <laughs> you you realize pretty quick, uh, yeah, we're not all making plays like McDavid. So yeah. <laughs> And you still, and, uh, I, I think too, like you still got to remind yourself and I don't know if Gio, you feel the same way, but I got to remind myself that of that as well. Like when I'm watching players and, you know, especially defensemen, I, I critique them pretty hard and just same thing. It's like, I mean, Christ, like he's got the space up the wall, just put the puck up the wall. And then I just remember myself in that situation and how it looks from ice level and, and not making the right decision and how quick everything is. So it is, you get caught up with it as a scout as well. I feel like. Yeah, I never really had a choice. Everything was either up the wall or off the glass. <laughs> like other than that line, and if it didn't get into the uh, across the blue line, I was probably not playing. So now I have to evaluate guys making plays rather than thinking of how I would play the situation. Sure, I remember how hard you were to play against. Uh, I'd I'd like to say as a checker myself, that was my reputation. But for some yes. reason, if I was ever out on the ice against you, I was like, oh. Oh no! <laughs> I was, honestly, I was you know yeah. I was running around this morning. I was thinking the same exact thing about you. Is God, I hate playing That's against them. Hate it. I remember. Were you on the same line as uh, Chris Collins and Brian Boyle at BC? That's when it started, and I was yeah, like, that was, "This that guy." Was year. So you would have been a sophomore. That was my senior yeah. year. Oh five, oh six. Yeah, it was so exactly. So it was Vermont's yeah. first year in Hockey East. It would have been. Yeah. You guys, yeah. you guys swept us in the first round of the playoffs. But I just remember, oh, well, what a lineup! First off, you guys had it was like I think Gerby was a, might have been a freshman. You had yeah. uh, Brock Bradford and uh, uh, Dan Bertram was on yeah. that team. Like well. there was a lot of young young talent coming through yeah. there. Great, great decor. But um, boy, you were you were tough to play against um so just curious we've we talked about it a little bit on on the last couple episodes uh just that that role that you find and you either especially at the nhl level you either need to harness it and say all right i'm a checker it's the only way i'm gonna last here or or you still try to hang on to the well you know i had a point of game in college like maybe i can uh I'm a skill yeah. guy nationally, yeah. but yeah. Uh, at one point, at one point, for me it was, and I'll give you, you'll be able to answer. But for me, it was like 20 games in my NHL career. I was like, yeah, I'm a grinder. I'm a grinder. How do I survive? How long did it take you to realize at the professional rank? Because uh, I know you were, you know, you put up some good numbers in college, but the professional rank, how long did it take you to realize that? Uh, definitely not in my first three games when I signed out senior year. I scored three goals and had an assist in my first pro game. I was like, oh, this is easy. Like, I'm good. It's easy. Uh, yeah. I was having, like, four goals and assists in the three games that I played to start my career. I'm like, yeah, that's that's not sustainable. Uh, right. it, was, it was probably, I would say, 15 games in my first year in the American League. Uh, I was getting some PP time, uh, but I was getting more PK. And I'm like, listen, I'm looking at, the devil's roster. And even if I have a chance, I'm like, there's no way I'm making it anywhere other than the fourth line. So the next year, I didn't get any PP time. And I'm like, yep, that's definitely just hard to PK. The, you know, whatever I get for minutes, just block the shot, play the right way and see what happens. But it still took, still took five years to, to get there permanently. Yeah. So, so we, we had, um, we had Gomer obviously on here, uh, what, like last oh, week, he was talking about, um, you know, coming up through the Devils organization or whatever. But he had obviously a different experience. He was right in the NHL right away. What yep. was it like coming up, you know, under a Lou Lamorello run organization from from starting down in the American Hockey League? You guys are in Lowell at the time, right? Yeah, we were. I went in. My first three games were in Albany. And then the next year, my first full year, they moved to Lowell. Okay. So, And, you know, it was good because, you know, you're close to the city. Uh, close to Boston, which, you know, who doesn't like Boston? Um, you know, it, the clean shaven was, was a big thing. And, uh, you know, it reminded me of Lou seeing your, your baby face this morning. <laughs> I signed on. I was like, oh man, I know that too well. I was like, I don't know if I can go back and work for Lou just cause I like the beard too much. Yeah. Um, 
you know, it, it he has his his quote unquote, I guess you say rules, but he takes care of his players, his families, you know, the, the, the families of the players, you know, through the minors, you know, they, they, they cared about you just as much as if you were there. And, you know, that's kind of been their MO all the way up and, you know, it, it gets even better and how they take care of families when you get there. And I, I think it goes a long way with guys. You know, you had a, as to Strader's point, kind of a different route to the NHL. You started down in the HL, and it was a grind to get there and then be able to stay there. Strader, this is kind of for you also because you had a similar kind of path. Minor league baseball gets romanticized, like the journey of riding the, the bus and, and just the, the grind it takes to get there. Minor league baseball gets romanticized. What is the road like in minor league hockey to get to the NHL and stay there? Uh, it's... It's a, a grind is, is a good <laughs> word for it. Uh, you know, there's times you're living paycheck to paycheck. You know, yeah. you're, you're what you're making throughout the year. Yeah, it may be great, but you don't get a paycheck in the summer. Mm-hmm. And that money's going to last you year round. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, there was times that you're asking for a rent check just for a deposit the next year in, in training camp. You know, it helps, it helps having a brother that's, you know, making 5 million a year. Hey, I need uh you said you just put send a deposit here for me for <laughs> I'll get you back when I get my first paycheck. But it's you know, back then when we got started, guys weren't getting paid as much as they are now in mm-hmm. the AHL. Like guys can make a, a good living in the American League now. Um, and even towards the end of my career, I was I was overpaid by a lot playing in the minors, but I was okay with it. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> What, what he said, when I started out too, like I told that story about um, the lockout year where I had just started making NHL money. Then I'm going back to the American Hockey League and I just bought my first house. And I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to pay my mortgage? Because we're locked out and I'm on my American League salary right now. But to his point, there are guys making a ton of money, especially veteran players coming in that need to fill in, um, you know, top six roles or whatnot for your American League team and you can actually make a pretty penny and it's 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 you know it's I think getting there um was a struggle and but when you're young and you're riding the bus and you're just enjoying the process of it it's really not it's really not that difficult and and obviously you know you're compensated at the NHL level and if you hang on long enough and you're a veteran in the American League they compensate you well now as well it is true. I mean, that's also, I mean, the first five years, that's when you're right out of college or right out of junior, it's the first time that you've ever even been making money. You know, yeah. so even if it is, even if it was at the time, you know, 60 grand, uh, you were still kind of happy with that. Now, if you end up making the NHL, then you go back down, you're still grinding, which obviously happens very common, very often, then it's, then it's a grind. Then it mm-hmm. feels much more of a grind back on the bus in your 30s. But um, yeah, not everyone can be silver spoon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's it's funny you bring that up too, is because I I got both ends of it, like Gio here too. Like I got back down, and I took on um, like a leadership role right uh, up in when we were in Binghamton for a couple of years, and it's like it is good, like because like when you get back down there, what my initial thought was like this is great. It's a new role for me. I'm trying to help these guys develop, get, get along their way. Cause now the American league is like, you have two, three veterans on your team and that's like it. And everybody else is on their entry level deal and they're trying to push. Um, but it was a good task for me at the time and, and kind of actually a way getting into what I'm getting into now, I think just because you get a little bit closer with, you know, the people making the decisions, um, but I do think it wears on you. Like it wore on me after like a year or two. I'm like, oh, like, I don't know if I can just keep job now. this, you know, yeah. just stay on this downhill slide and, and just help these, you know, I, I want to, I want to, you know, progress through a new career as well. So it, it is a grind the second time around. And if you're not, uh, if, if they're not compensating you well enough, um, you know, it, it, you, you start thinking about other things. Gio, as somebody who was coming up, as we just talked about, you've had two seasons where you played, I believe, more than 60 games in the NHL. Did you ever feel comfortable that you were there to stay, or were you always looking over your shoulder? Every single day I was looking over my shoulder. <laughs> Every single day. There was the, I, I played, you know, obviously injuries play a huge role in, in careers as well. There's one season I played 82, yep. and I don't know how I did it. 
based off of the injuries I played through. Like they lingered for a couple of years and it was, if I miss a practice, I feel like I'm going to be out of the lineup. So I practice with the injuries. I, you know, very rarely did I let myself take a day off because if I take a day off, then this younger kid behind me is going to take my spot. And, you know, I got a funny story on that. Sorry to cut you off. You're good. But, and I'm not going to name the team I was playing on because I don't, it's probably not a good idea, but <laughs> I stuck my toe at like four in the morning on a uh, suitcase in my room uh, at home. And I wake up in the morning and my little toe is, I, it's broken, it's dangling. And I get to the rink and I terrified. I can hardly walk on the thing. It's, it yeah. blew up overnight and I can't get my foot in my skate. So I get out on the ice. I tape it to my other toe and I ask one of my teammates to fake fire a puck off my foot so I could drop dead on the ice. Mm -hmm. That's the <laughs> story. I know. So then I get off the ice and, uh, and I got my little toe injected for a month straight after that just so i could stay in the games mm -hmm. and my little toe still hurts to the day which is comical but um it's just you you gotta survive that's yeah. so fun especially the fourth line guys yes yeah there's yeah someone there ready to take your spot and you know i i had i was dealing with an ankle injury that year an elbow that i got injected a couple times like morning skate i couldn't even shoot a puck because my elbow hurt so bad so I didn't even, I would just make a couple passes. If I came in on the goalie, I just flipped the puck. Now I'd feel better come game time because I would, you know, obviously take something. It would help, help a little bit with the pain, but you're going right. through two games feeling like that. It's in the morning, your body is just aching. A while, it takes a while to warm up. When you look yeah. back at your entire career, that's a fun question I asked, uh, got retired guys. Uh, what year was your favorite year of hockey? Let's say from perhaps go freshman year of college on, what year would you look back and say, ah, that was my favorite year? Um, I would have to say probably my first year in Long Island with the Islanders. Um, went in on a tryout, broke my leg in preseason, uh, blocking mm -hmm. a shot. Uh, missed the first couple of weeks, but once I was healthy, got called up. I think it was just before Christmas. I was there the rest of the year. It was a really good group of guys. And, you know, after, you know, being in Jersey and you, you kind of get a fresh, fresh start, fresh look at what's out there. I spent 10 years in Jersey, whether minor NHL and to go somewhere else and, and the group there, which is still pretty, pretty close to the group that was there when I was there. And just a great group of guys. I had a lot of fun. You know, we missed playoffs by one point. Um, it was just, it was a good year. And I wasn't either. Maybe played 24 games that year. Uh, mm -hmm. Out of the lineup. Uh, I was an extra, which is what it is, right? But I, I got to say that was one of my, one of the years I remember the best. You win two Stanley Cups now as a scout with the Lightning. One in the COVID bubble year and one in the COVID impacted season of last year. Um when you win a cup on that side of the glass, is it like, you know, proud parent feeling like, Hey, I'm proud of these guys. I'm just proud to be a part of it. It means a lot. Or does it make you more jealous that you didn't win one as a player? Uh, winning it. It doesn't matter how you win it. Like those guys, the guys that played, obviously, you know, we've played the sacrifice they had just so I had a chance to lift the Stanley cup. Like I will be forever grateful for that. Like it doesn't, when I got my hands on it the first time, I was like, "This is this is fucking awesome." There's <laughs> just, there's no denying it. It's it's fucking awesome. And watching to see what those guys go through in a playoff run and do it back to back years, and I reap the benefit by watching them from up above. Like it's you know, it, it's a proud parent moment rather than a, a jealousy. Yeah. Given Mitch going to UVM and Batesy when he's actually here going to UVM, we're a pro UVM podcast. So Ross Colton game winner in game five, I guess. So we're very, yeah. we're excited for the lightning here too. Yes. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. He made me feel really old in that celebration. <laughs> he, he, uh, he mentioned that he watched me play in the finals in 12 and he was like, 
12 or 13 years old. I'm like, oh, oh my uh, God. I make me feel really old right now, but <laughs> thank you for scoring that goal. <laughs> and, you know, you felt to do it then, and you're helping me get it now. So, uh, but yeah, it's it's funny how it, it kind of comes around like that. that Did you drink beer out of the Stanley Cup? I'm not sure what was in it. Okay. <laughs> a mixture of a lot. It was, it, was, it was an interesting mixture. Uh, we'll just put it that way. Liquid. Yes. There, were, there was something. It was the kind of thing that would lead you to a garbage plate at two thirty in the morning. <laughs> it was it was a long night. It was a long night. No, that's for sure. The timestamp on that was God. Had to be close to four a.m. That's awesome. <laughs> Did they they flew a bunch of you guys down there, right? For like, yeah, so down. they they uh, we couldn't go into Montreal, obviously, with COVID yeah. stuff. So they flew my wife and I down, put us up in the hotel for roughly a week. And it, it was an open-ended stay. Like we ended up, like we were there for a week and uh, the parade was still two days away or like it was Monday. I think we ended up leaving Saturday. Uh, and I'm like, I just, I got to go home. Like <laughs> I, I can't do this anymore. Like, so we ended up booking our flight, but they, they flew my wife and I down, ever paid for everything. Uh, we end up flying my kids down. My in-laws live in Sarasota. So we put them there just in case they could be involved. And, you know, they weren't at the game with us, but it was, uh, it was quite the experience and the organization has, has been awesome. You didn't let your brother touch the Stanley cup. I read You didn't let him touch it. My brother. Oh, yeah. We lifted, we lifted it together. Oh, okay. I, I thought I heard you we didn't let him touch it. Together. No, no. I let him touch it. It's all right. <laughs> I just tell him I have two rings to his one now. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Oh. Wow. Wow. Um, you know, one thing I want to – I do want to ask one question about your brother. Like, I'm just curious. Um, the Olympics are upon us. The Olympics are are up in the air as far as whether the league is going to go and whether or not guys are going to go. Your brother went in, what are we now, 20 – I don't even – 2018, and he was kind of in a, a different role because most of the NHL – you know, NHL guys, present NHL guys weren't there. What was his Olympic experience like, especially being – I think he was like 37 playing with a bunch of college kids. Yeah, he, he was old. He was old. I know – you know, he was contemplating retirement, and that summer, USA Hockey called him. And they're like, listen, uh, we want you to be the captain. Uh, so he skated with Rochester the whole year. Like, skated with with the Americans, with the Amherst here in Roch. Ended up playing one game with them before going over. But he embraced the leadership role. Uh, I never I never played with him in a game. I was in training camp with him, but never, never played with him, only against him. You know, Mitch, I know you played with him. I don't know. You know, I've only heard about his leadership. I've never seen it firsthand. Um, but he embraced that role with them. And, you know, I I thought he, you know, enjoyed it. Uh, he ended up signing with Boston after, but it was something that he was looking forward to, kind of going over to South Korea and, and being the, the captain there. He, uh, well, first off, this is supposed to be your moment. It shouldn't be. We shouldn't be going. Uh, it doesn't it always, it always end up. Always ends up on him, anyways. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll dive into his career quick. He uh, he just had that presence about him. Uh, you know, when he walked in the locker room, uh, everyone, especially in Buffalo, who had such bad teams, but uh, he's got a calming presence about him. You you knew that he was such an incredible player uh, coming out of college with his numbers, and then you know, how, how impactful he was and how easy he made the game look in New Jersey uh, and in Montreal. So when I got to Buffalo with him, uh, you know, he, when guys that have that presence and that experience, and I know he had lost a step. I mean, he was playing with me half the, half the time. I was anchoring him down, the poor guy. But, <laughs> it was the other way around. The, the, the other way around. He was anchoring you down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell myself that. But he he just had that calming presence. You know, he was always someone. He was someone that you can go to, and he'd give you the right answer. <laughs> you know, did I do this or this? And he had an answer for it. Uh, that's why you know he was such a good leader throughout his career. But specifically in Buffalo, near the end of his career. I mean, I think he signed when he was thirty six or thirty seven, right? Yeah. Um, he just uh, he just had that presence about him. Yeah. Crazy. We always ask this question, or I always ask this question. Batesy always asks how the game has changed. That's his go-to. My go-to question is, I always want to know who guys' best teammates or veteran mentors were. So, Gio, who's the guy that put their arms around you, the guy you went to for answers coming through? Ooh, I had, when I first started out, I had a lot of good veterans in Lowell. 
We had Dan McGillis, uh, Grant Marshall, Motto was there, Ian Moran. Like we had some some guys that had been there, won cups. They've you know they had long careers. So I learned early from those guys to get to the rink early, have a cup of coffee, sit on the couch. And you know I was always the first guy at the rink with those guys, and I'd have a cup of coffee, sit on the couch, relax uh, before we got our day started. Uh, when I got up, you know. In New Jersey, I would say probably one of similar to, to Brian's kind of leadership, Andy Green. Now, Greener will – he calls me his human stress ball. So <laughs> he's having a tough day. He, he says he likes to give me a good squeeze and make fun of me. But, you know, he is – you know, him, him and Adam Henry, uh, probably two of the guys I was closest to in New Jersey, uh, Greener – you know, I was, I was, couldn't be happier to see someone get their thousandth game uh, than Greener. Uh, just that calming influence on the bench, on the ice, like ultimate pro. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and that, that's all you, that's, you think of, of him, ultimate pro. So he's probably one of, even same year we were, it's still a guy I uh, look to in the locker room for, for answers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Last question here for me. If anybody else has something after me, feel free to jump in. But uh, we had Megan Duggan on a couple episodes ago when we talked about the growth of of girls hockey and how her Olympic team inspired a whole generation of young female players. Well, you're also working, as I understand it, with the uh, with the girls hockey community in Rochester. What are you up to there? Uh, so my daughter's just turned 12. So I've coached her the last couple of years when I'm around. Hmm. Uh, it's a little hard. Uh, sometimes it fit it in, but, um, last year we started a girls program with the Rochester junior Americans, uh, started with the 12 U, uh, which was my daughter's team. And then this year, uh, she's still a 12 U added a 14 U, uh, and a 10 U. Um, and we kind of partnered with one of the other organizations here to offer, which is Webster, uh, youth hockey to offer kind of a tier two level, uh, for the girls. So it's, it's slowly coming along and starting to take off. It's it's becoming more popular here in Rochester, and the organization is doing a great job. Um, you know, social media all the time, everything. Uh, I also have a, a girls only hockey camp in the summer for we kind of run through the hockey academy here. Um, so it, it you know it's fun. You know, I'm I'm out there. It's a lot less stress than the boys' side. The girls <laughs> listen to you. Yeah, they, they, sometimes they're too literal, and you want them to kind of be free flowing on the ice. <laughs> uh, but they listen, they work, and it's been a lot of fun. Like there's, uh, you know, the girls on the team, like they can skate, like it's they can make plays, and it, it's fun to watch sometimes. That's so funny. Here in Vermont, the the girls, the top girls, play with the boys until probably age like twelve or thirteen. Some mm-hmm. of them, yeah. and. I, I'm amazed at uh, the level of play of some of the girls here. I mean, we have we have a bunch of girls that are committed to some pretty big D1 schools, D1 programs, and they're you're so right. They take it all in. They listen so well. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. I just can't get my own three daughters to listen to me. But <laughs> other, <laughs> other girls, they just it's it's amazing how they just process information so much better at that age than the boys. The boys are just banging their heads all over the place, but the girls they process it. It's it's yeah. I I enjoy uh, the skill sessions with the girls, uh, specific specifically in Vermont because um, you know the top ones are just as good as the boys until yeah. like age 11, 12. I don't know about Rochester, but yeah, I see. Have, there's three girls three girls on uh, the team now that play with the boys team one made the triple a, but because of rules, she couldn't play with them because of state rules or uh, uh, interest ever is. So, and then two of them run kind of the double a team. Um, and then there's, there's a couple that could have made other boys teams. Like, I mean, my daughter has, I think five or six girls on the team. She's been playing with for five or six years now. Mm-hmm. They've oh. kind of come up together. So they've kind of built that bond together all oh nine birth years and, and, you know, a lot of these girls will go, like my daughter plays in Boston for Boston team over the summer. She plays with the uh, Lady Whalers. Uh, so she has the last two years. And then a bunch of the girls, they're, they're all over the place. So it's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, watch It's fun to watch them kind of grow up and, and you know, see how they play the game. Now, just, my daughter's the only girl that oh. doesn't listen. 
<laughs> the only one. Now that's normal. Though. Right? Pleads with her, like, listen, if you're ever going to listen to your dad, this is the one thing you should listen to him about is hockey. It's the one thing that he could teach you some stuff, but yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> no. I, I bang my head on a wall. Like, I say something there, she'll just kind of fuck off and, you know, yeah. turn, turn her back and go go play. There, there's quite a few at our facility, at Elevator too here, our facility, there's quite a few uh, U- University of Vermont hockey alums that have uh, stuck around in the area and they have they have boys boys and girls um, that they're sending over here. They have just as much hockey knowledge as, you know, possibly as, as some of our instructors, but they still send their kids here because they can't get any, you know, they get them out on the backyard rink in the winter and they don't want to listen to dad. Nope. Yep. So it's nope. like, we're doing, you know, I'm like showing them drills to do with their kids on the back of the rink. They're like, yeah, they're not doing it. And I'm like, well, all right, send them here. And they're dialed in. They're incredible on the ice here. Yeah. Yeah. That's so yeah. 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 The amount of, the amount of dads I have told me, like, I say the same exact things as you to my son and he yeah. just doesn't, doesn't, you know, it doesn't register. But when you say it, it does. I'm like, well, yeah, cause I'm not his dad. That's just how, how it goes. No, but you, you, uh, you got the the wheels spinning in my head the other day when we were chatting about it because I just got my girls started to skate now too. They're yep. five and three, and I'm like, oh, that kind of sounds kind of fun, you know, coaching yeah. the girls. And so I don't know, I don't I don't want the um, program around here, the girls program, to get a whiff that I'm I'm you know sniffing around that kind of stuff because I know they'll suck me right in. But <laughs> uh, I'm I'm sure it will happen eventually, right? Yeah, it, it, it's true. It will happen eventually. <laughs> like I. I was an assistant coach on the team, just kind of helping out, staying in the back, mm-hmm. and eventually ended up, you know, being the head coach. <laughs> that's there, like an assistant coach. Yeah, they already they already got me last week with the first skating session. They were yeah. like, they're like, yeah, you know, if you want to bring your skates out next time, I'm like, all right, I'll bring them next time. So yeah. I know yeah. it's only a matter of time. Hey, you're it, it, you're locked in now. Like you're you're stuck. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's your future right now. Yeah, the next yeah. 13 years until she turns 18, I guess 15 until the other one turns 18. You're you're locked in. You're committed yeah, there, Strader. Yeah, so yeah, win a know. win a cup with the Devils and then win some junior uh, girls hockey championships. That <laughs> resume will be really filled out for you. <laughs> Thanks, Farky. You're welcome. So <laughs> thank you to Stephen Gianta for stopping by here on episode number nine. A former NHL player, current NHL scout with the world champion Tampa Bay Lightning. Geo, next time I'm in Rochester, garbage plates on you, and we will see you later. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, guys. Boom. A great conversation with Stephen Gianta. A lot of good stuff came out of that. A lot of good stories and perspectives as we continue to uh, just rack up a very, very impressive guest list here on the Elevate 02 podcast. As always, you can follow us on social media, Elevate 02, the podcast on Instagram. Just search for Elevate 02 podcast. Regular Elevate 02 Instagram account, which has all swaggy peas, great stick handling drills, and all kinds of cool stuff there. You can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Also watch our podcast on YouTube, and you can email us at uh, elevate02 podcast at gmail.com. So, everybody, we will be back again with another great guest in episode 10. I already can't wait for you guys to listen to it next Wednesday. And uh, for Strader, Batesy, who's not here, I'm Farky. Mitch, get the last word. Boom. We'll see you back here in episode 10, everybody, on the Elevate 02 podcast. This is the Elevate 02 podcast, the podcast bringing you inside the world of hockey, from on the ice to inside the front office. We bring you places you've never been before.